and uh, DC is kind enough to join us uh, on the phone right now. So uh, I want to say hello to DC off the bat and uh, welcome him to the program. DC, how are you? What's up, Ariel? How you doing, man? Ah oh, man, it's a tough day, and I and and I I've never even met uh, Kobe. I was at the one press conference when they announced the body armor deal, and I was in his presence, and uh, that was a thrill. But I know you uh, knew him, and I know how much you uh, admired him, and so I just want to ask you, how are you feeling on this Monday after yesterday's tragedy? You know, it's just sad, man. It's really sad because you don't expect to ever see anything like that, and. For all the people that perished in, in, in the helicopter accident, it's just terrible, you know, because you constantly think about the fact that they were just going to do something positive, you know, passing on, you know, the game that's given him so much, you know, and, and taking all these families along for the ride, you know. I, I think about the other people, and I don't know their relationship to Kobe, but um, he probably thought that he was going to make their lives easier, you know, instead of sitting in traffic for hours and we can just travel to the team together and, you know, and then ultimately, like, everybody's gone. It's just a really sad thing. And I can't really shake the idea or the vision in my head of, like, those final moments, you know, that it, it just really, it really tears me apart to think of those last few moments, you know, whenever... Because you got kids, you, when you have kids, I've, I've had things happen to me where I'm with little Daniel or Marquita and, and uh, the car like shifts or, or anything. And they're like, Dad, what happened? Dad, what's going on? You know, and you know that's exactly what he was going through when, when that was happening. You know, him and the little girl probably looked to him and said, Dad, what's going on? And he tried to try to assure that everything was going to be okay when it wasn't going to be, you know, it's a really, really bad thing to think about. And that's all I've been thinking about for the last, you know, 24 hours. It's like, as parents, we sometimes have to be brave in the face of things that we know we can't overcome. And I'm sure that's exactly what KB was doing when that was happening, you know, do you remember the first time you met him, the first time you spoke to him? So I met Kobe the first The first time I ever met Kobe was way back in 2004 at the Olympic Games, and he was just so accessible. You know, like, he would be at the Olympic Village and take anybody's picture, and he didn't really, like, cord himself off from everybody. He would, you know, obviously... It, it gets overwhelming when you have a profile like he did. So he was still there, you know, and he was always kind of like a nice guy. He was always a nice guy, but it was a difference to me meeting Kobe as a wrestler and the day I went in there as a, as, 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 you know, a guy that he had heard do a, a tryout for his show and that he was going to meet, but it wasn't a difference in me, right? For all that I accomplished, it was a difference in him. Right? Like for as nice as he was in Athens, you could just tell that he was so driven. He was just so driven. And when I walked into that office, he was smiling so much and cracking jokes and was just so nice. And I couldn't even believe it. Like, I couldn't believe that this was the guy that we had seen for so long as just this fierce competitor, like, would not accept anything less than being the best. And he was just like, a, he just seemed like a different person. He was just completely at ease and in his office. And I don't know. It was, so, I was so happy. I was so happy to have started and really started to make a relationship with someone like that. It was, it was crazy. Yeah, I'll, I'll never forget you calling me right after, and you're like, guess who I just met with? Guess who I was just in his office? Um, yeah. And you were like, I, to hear you, as accomplished as you are, the legend that you are in our sport, honestly sound like a 10-year-old kid meeting his idol. It was it was amazing. It was great to, to hear you in, the, in that kind of state. Um, you really seemed, you know overjoyed by the fact that not only you got to meet with him and it seemed like he was inspiring you, but also that you were going to be working with him. Uh, and so I will never yeah. forget that I, for as long as I live. I remember who was in the car with you. It was just a great moment. 
you know, I was, I was, when I went, when I went, I didn't truly know what to expect, right? You think you're going to walk in and see a guy that's larger than life, and you don't know if he's going to stand above you or if, you know, you don't know. Because for, for everything that I accomplished, you know, I've always looked up to, you know, all that he he done. And he just was put himself right on your level, you know, and, and talked about how, it was going to be me, him, and Peyton, and I was going to be mentioned in such glorified air. It was, it was just, it was just insane to me to be talking to Kobe Bryant. Like, and then it just got better because we exchanged contact info, and then I'm like, what is going? You know, like this can't even be real. And then to have a guy like Kobe who you're working with, but also he's your boss. Like this is his company. And if things are going well, you get a random text saying how things are going well and your show is killing it. It was, it was, it was just, it was, a, it was different. And I, I know that you're very proud to be the the face of this show. I would imagine now, as you mentioned um, last night on social media, that now takes a whole other, you know, uh, a whole other meaning for you right now. Like now, you want to do this for him, correct? Yeah. Absolutely, Ariel. And, want to study harder and, and, you know, be more quiet and just be more like really in the, in the moment. You know, I, I love doing the show and I've done it to the best of my ability, but I know that every time he did that show or every time he did anything, he tried to do it better than he did it before. And I want to take that approach now. I want to, I want to be, I want to study more. I want to, he was such a, he was such a, giant in terms of mental preparation that I want to make sure that I'm doing the same thing and representing this show and doing the show that he created from the ground up justice. I mean, you know, this is something that I've never really told people, but when I met, when I met Kobe and we started talking and we started talking about the show and I said, well, maybe I'll do them around the time guys will fight. You know, maybe I'll talk to the UFC about who they're picking. He goes, don't do that. It's your show. I said about maybe ESPN. He said, don't do that. It's your show. I said, well, we got to pick people like the fans like, right? He's like, no, it's not for the fans. He was adamant about the show not truly being meant for fans. Granted, they watch it, and if they can appreciate it, good. But detail was never made for it. ESPN or the fans or the UFC to choose and build fights with. Detail was made for that guy. And this was his words. He said, this show is made for the guy. That's why you stand on top of the octagon with those two belts and thought to himself, I want to do that. Or the kid that saw you become the champion and said, I want to do what Daniel Cormier did. He said, so don't cheat that guy. Give him the tools. Try to help him understand the work and the little things that he's going to have to do in order to accomplish that. Old girl, you know, because he was a big advocate for female sports. He said, give them, this This is a chance for you to give them those things, those tools, show them the little details that they can take into their career that will hopefully one day give them a chance. That's who the show's for. Not for anybody else. And uh, that's always stuck with me. You know, I was I, doing a show and I would think like how is this going to be received and you know he always assured me it was never what it was never going to be that and as I'm in the studio doing it you know I'd see KB outside of the door watching and as I'd come out and listen in he, he was so hands-on he would listen in and when I walked out after doing the Amanda Nunez show he told me that this is going to be the most popular detail on ESPN the UFC he goes because he goes, you're good at it, and the sport is just booming. And I'll never forget those words, man. Man, it's tough. And his relationship with his uh, his daughter, especially from an athletic standpoint, reminds me a lot of your relationship uh, with your son, Dan Jr., and being there and trying to, you know, be at every practice and be so involved. And, and so I'm sure that you see a little bit of yourself in, in that, too. I, I was struggling. I didn't know if I should tell my son, who's around the same age as, as your son as well. I didn't know how to explain this. I'm, I don't want to shield them from real-life things. But did you, and your son, I think, is a little more in tune with sports than mine is. Did, did you tell him what happened? I didn't. 
you know, me and my wife were down and we ran out to the room from the kids. My wife was crying just, my wife was crying just so much because of the stories I told Co- about Kobe. You know, she hadn't met him yet, you know, and I'm not going to sit here and pretend him and I were best friends. You know, right. It was just random times, you know, but I would tell her stories about when I was in there talking to him or, or if, uh, or if, uh, you know, I got something saying the show was doing good or <sighs> even, um, you know, they can see it, you know, like we got a Christmas gift with a, with a, with a, with a note signed by KB, you know, like obviously maybe it's something that goes out probably to the entire staff that works there. But it looked like he took time to sign every one. And it's like, those things mean something. You know, you don't know, you don't know how people take things my wife saw that and she saw the act and uh so we're in the other room and we're not saying anything and little daniel walks in like five o'clock at night and it's on the tv and she, he goes wait Kobe bryant died and i said yeah and i told them and explained it and he was like wow like just like just you know he's like wow you know and that just tells you that it's like he transcended generation right because Older than people, all people older than me love Kobe Bryant. People my age, which was Kobe's age, love Kobe Bryant. Uh, now my children know who Kobe Bryant is. You know, Dan was eight years old, and uh, he knew who Kobe Bryant was. Yeah, you know, and it's just so tough. And and again, like you said, it's very scary because I try to go to everything. I'll jump on a plane early in the morning to get back to a wrestling tournament. We're always together, and that's what makes me. That's what makes it so scary. And it's it's sad because you got to think he's done that thousands of times. Him and Gianna, you know, like going to games and going to practice, and and you just never know, you know, you just never know. I could sit here and uh, ask you about him, reminisce. I know you're a big basketball fan as well, uh, all the memories. Um, but I know we have limited time with you, so. Of course, I want to ask you about yourself and the state of, of your career. You told us last time we spoke around four months ago, you want one more fight and that's it. Uh, but it seems like Stipe is uh, still on the sidelines and his return is indefinite. Where are you at right now? How long do you plan on waiting for him? And, and if he is not ready to return, are you going to fight someone else or is that it? Well, you know, I am... Uh, I, um... Right now, I'm, I'm just I'm getting back to work. I have a procedure this week because Steve is not the only guy that's banged up, you know, and hurt. You know, like I was, I had a bad back surgery last December, and um, you know, obviously there's still little lingering things in regards to that. I'm going back to do something else uh, this week, uh, get some treatments done. I about went to Panama on Joe Rogan. You know, Joe Rogan told me about this great stem cell treatment they have down there that could potentially help me get through a fight camp. And uh, obviously, I'm, I look into that, but uh, we'll see what happens. But I don't really feel like fighting anyone else. I mean, or where I fight, it's going to be for the championship, or I'm not going to fight. You know, so at this point, Steve Emiochi has the ability to retire. And uh, I gave him a rematch. I was very uh, forward in everything I did. I wasn't ready to fight Derek Lewis. I wasn't. But you have seen me to someone. I was, uh, I'm the guy that's always stepped up. You know, they gave me a fight that uh, I thought I could compete in, and I took it. That's why I fought him instead of Stipe uh, in November. But it's just so crazy to me how he was, so quick to step up on three weeks' notice back then because he didn't have the belt. But the moment he gets the belt, he just he just changes. I don't I don't understand how people don't see this or what it truly is. It's kind of insane, but it is what it is. I'm happy, man. I, you know, with everything that's going on, you can't linger in things that are sad. He wants to run away from the fight and let him run away from the fight. He wants to man up and fight me, he'll man up and fight me. Um, he fought, I mean, that guy fought four, five rounds almost, and I've won almost four of them. Won about three and three fourths of, of five rounds. So I can imagine why he wouldn't want to fight again. 
When you read uh, some of his comments, managers' comments, are, are these things starting to rub you a little bit the wrong way? Are you starting to feel like, you know, it's it's not a hundred percent on the up and up, and that they're kind of making you wait as as they believe you made them wait? You know, I had back surgery. <laughs> I couldn't have done it any sooner. I probably shouldn't have even done it. Like honestly, now that I think about it, I probably shouldn't have even fought in August. I mean, I was able to wrestle for two and a half weeks before the fight. I couldn't start kicking until less than a month before the fight. Like, I was just boxing. I was boxing and clinching for six weeks before the fight. Like, I, I didn't want to keep the guy waiting. I didn't want to not fight. Like, I like to compete. That's what I've done my whole life. So, they think they're playing a game with me and whatever. You know, it's not even, like, not even upsetting. It's just kind of like, it's almost like it just kind of breaks you down. Like, you but, but I have faith in I have faith in the UFC. I have faith in Dana White. I have faith in all the things that him and I have spoken about uh, in regards to this fight. And if uh, if if he doesn't get right, then you know we'll see what happens. We'll see if, if he if maybe I get an opportunity for an interim championship, or maybe he gets stripped of the title. I mean, I don't remember this is a guy that's won one fight in two years. You know, between UFC 226 and before he even fight in July, you know, over the course of those two years, he would have fought. He would have fought twice. He would have fought twice. So it's not like he's the most active guy. And and so just to be clear, if they did strip him or if they instituted an interim belt, is that good enough for you, or does it have to be attached to Stipe for this to all account? I would like it to be attached to Stipe, but if they tell me it's something different, then. If justice is served, you know, if justice is served, you know, like if, if, if he, most times the guy's away for that long, and usually something does happen, you know, so somebody told me last weekend, they said, well, you made him wait a year. I said, yeah, but I fought in that year, you know, like I didn't sit a whole year. So we'll see what happens. You know, everybody talks about poking him in his face, like, you know, if I ever did that, like it was 100% accidental. I never intend to stick a guy in his eye with my fingers. Um, if my thumb went in his face and I'm making a fist and my thumb hit him in the face and my thumb hit him in the face, it's not my thumbnail. It's my thumb. Move your head. So, I mean, I'm not trying to poke this guy in his face. I've always been respectful of, of Steve and the Oaches and always been, uh, I've always admired his, him for being honorable. And the honorable thing to do would be to fight again and just put an end to this trilogy. And do you have a deadline? Like if, if this doesn't materialize by the summer or the fall, because I know you want to kind of move on with I'd your like life as in, well. I'd like, I'd like to be in the summer. Look, man, I'm doing pretty good outside of the Octagon. You know, I've got uh, my detail show. I've got my UFC commentating career. Um, I've, got, I've got my businesses, my wrestling programs, and my barbershops and my restaurants. I've got some other TV things in the works, you know, and I, I've started to do uh, public speaking, and I've been getting a ton of engagement in that sense, talking about my story and how I've, I've overcome and become who I am today. So I've got a lot of things that can really sustain me for the rest of my life on top of all the stuff that I've made in my career. But this one's not about money. This is about him and I finishing what we got started. But uh, that's really all it is. But also because I just know I can beat him. You know, I know I can beat him. He did a really good job of landing those shots to the body the first time or the second time, but that won't be available anymore. I'm going to work tirelessly to try to fix that. And uh, I think I can beat him. And if, if I don't, if he manages to win again, okay, whatever. But I just know that I feel like we have unfinished business. So, so if it doesn't happen by the summertime, you would consider then just stopping? Yeah, because I can't. You can't wait forever. You know, every day that passes does not benefit me. Mm-hmm. So I'm a realist. I understand that. So we're going to do it, or we're not going to do it, or you know, we're going to fight, or this dude's going to put it into, you know, me as a fighter. So. I just don't understand why it's so difficult for our situation to truly be what it is. Like, I didn't just make the guy wait. I had back surgery. 
I had back surgery and fought him nine months after. Khabib had back surgery a few years ago and told me he didn't even start feeling like himself until after a year. So, if anything, I rushed back to the octagon. And last thing for you, DC, I'm just curious because I was wondering about it in the moment. Is it weird for you when you're interviewing Blades after his big win? He's talking about title shot and you're kind of just standing there with the same aspirations. Like what's what's going through? I, you do a great job of compartmentalizing and, and putting the analyst hat on, but I couldn't help but wonder what was actually going through your mind in that moment. That the kid actually deserved that. And in a different time, he'd probably right, be right on the cusp of it. You know, I don't, I harbor no ill feelings towards Curtis Blades. I thought he fought a great fight. I think that his career is heading in the right direction. And as the only guy in the top 12 under 30, he's got a really bright future ahead of him. But I, I can't help but think in, it, in in a different time, he'd be right on the verge. And, and honestly, just feeling happy for him. You know, people, people deserve their moment. And Curtis Blades got a moment last night, you know, our, Saturday night, and he did something that very few people have been able to do, and that's beat Junior in that striking room. So, uh, yeah, man, I don't, I don't feel, I don't feel, I don't feel ill will towards Curtis. You know, I think, I think Curtis, uh, he's won three fights in a row now, and uh, yeah, in a different time, he'd be, he'd probably be fighting for a championship. Unfortunately, I think that the UFC. Uh, knowing that Steve and I should be fighting and ultimately they're going to make the decision uh, for whatever they say. I just think that, I just think that Steve and, 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 you know, those guys are a little misguided. You want to fight Tyson Fury, 6'10", in a boxer, I'm 5'10", in a wrestler, and I was able to outstrike you for the vast majority of the fight. What's going to happen? You know, I'm going to be like Conor McGregor and Floyd Mayweather. These guys, like, you know, these guys can't build a fight like those two. Those two are the greatest fight builders in the history of combat sports. So, of course, it was going to be massive. It wouldn't be like that. DC, we will let you go. Thank you very much for coming on and uh, for sharing your thoughts about Kobe. If if, if you want to watch uh, detail, you can do so now on ESPN+. Plus. It's, it's a great show. I know you just uh, taped an episode about Conor McGregor, which I believe is out a week from today. Um, so I'm looking forward to that, and I've enjoyed every episode up until now. I know this wasn't easy, but I really appreciate it, my man. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, Eric.